Okay, so we're going to look at acetal formation. So a ketone or an aldehyde, an alcohol, or in this case a diol, and acid. And if you react those together in dry conditions, you'll end up with an acetal function group, which you'll have seen in the title slide. So what's the first thing that happens? Well, here we are doing a reaction with the carbonyl and a very poor nucleophile. So there's a few different ways of making these reactions happen uh, and increasing their likelihood. But if you were trying to identify an electrophile and a nucleophile, you'd say, well, this is our electrophile and this is our nucleophile. And you'd be correct, but this is not a very good nucleophile and this is not a very good electrophile. So we have to activate the electrophile. And we do that by protonating the ketone or the aldehyde. So that lone pair of electrons is going to form a new oxygen-hydrogen bond. And that takes us on our first step. And there's quite a few steps to this. So each one of them is, in fact, reversible. So we've now made that oxygen-hydrogen bond. We've protonated our ketone. And we still have the alcohol. And I'm going to move the alcohol down here for reasons which will become apparent now. So now we have a very good electrophile because that's an oxygen with a positive charge on it. And in fact, if you were to look at it, it would resonate between the carbocation and having the positive charge up in the oxygen. But we'll treat it in this form because this is uh, the one that's going to be useful for us doing that reaction. And we can attack it with our nucleophile. So one of these lone pairs is going to form a new carbon-oxygen bond. And like every other time you attack a carbon, carbon you break the carbon-oxygen double bond and you paste another pair of electrons up onto the oxygen. So, so far so good. Next step. Everything we've drawn out in the last step that doesn't have an arrow going from it or to it must still be there. So what do we do? Well, let's leave in our lone pairs. We took this pair of electrons and we made, oh, sorry. We took this pair of electrons and we made a new oxygen carbon bond. So if that is now sharing the pair of electrons that it had all to itself, it has a positive charge on it. And we took this pair of electrons, which was shared between the carbon and the oxygen, and we put it up onto the oxygen. So it now is neutral again because it has its two lone pairs back all to itself. And this carbon still has four bonds because we've made a bond and broken a bond. So far, so good. Well, what happens next? So this is usually the point at which you say this is a tetrahedral intermediate. And well, it is a tetrahedral intermediate in some senses. But if we were to reverse that and reform the carbon oxygen double bond, we'd kick out the same leaving group that was the one that we added in the first place. So we go backwards. And we're not going to kick out either of those carbons as we discussed, because Carbons don't generally get kicked out with a negative charge on them, especially not in acidic conditions like this. So something else has to happen first. We're going to have to move a proton from here and activate our leaving group. So this proton is going to leave. And this is going to take up another proton from somewhere else in solution. And it might be another molecule in this state, or it might be an alcohol that was protonated earlier in the reaction. But in any event, if we put it in inverted commas, we can imagine that it's taking up a H+. Now, you and I both know that there are no H pluses floating around because they sit into any lone pair that's available to them. If it was in water, it'd be H3O+. Plus. But for the sake of convenience, we'll draw it out like that. So what have we got? Well, next step. That's our proton transfer done. We now have everything exactly as it was. except for what we have moved. So we took the proton off here. It's now got its lone pairs back. Those lone pairs are there as well. And we took a proton onto this one. So it now has a positive charge. And now it can be our leaving group, and we can reform a carbon-oxygen double bond. So let's do that. Kick out the water, form a carbon-oxygen double bond. The water leaves. And we'll start again down here. What have we got? Well, dry out everything as we had it before we started changing things around. Unless it had an arrow going from it, it has to still be there. So 
So they are all the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens that were there beforehand. And the only thing that we've moved is some electrons. So we took this pair of electrons and we made a new carbon oxygen double bond. That oxygen now has to have the positive charge on it. And we took this pair of electrons and we gave them back to oxygen. So that's water. Water can leave and we're left with this intermediate. And you've probably guessed that this is a really good electrophile because we have an oxygen with a positive charge on it, much like we had up here. What's going to happen next? Well, we now have a nucleophile which is in the same molecule. So we can have an intramolecular reaction. So this doesn't even have to wait to bump into a nucleophile. It's got a nucleophile waiting in the wings. So that's going to happen next. This is going to attack and we can draw it attacking that carbon and giving that pair of electrons back to the oxygen. What does that look like? Well, let's draw that out. So at this stage, I'm going to change the angles going on here because it's getting a bit crowded. So that was a double bond. It's now a single bond because we've moved one of those. That's still there. That's still there. That's still there. That one lone pair was there before we started going. That's still there. And that's still there. And what did we do? We took this lone pair of electrons, put them in here, and we took that lone pair of electrons and put them back in the oxygen. And since this oxygen is now sharing a pair of electrons, it has the positive charge on it. Well, we're nearly there. We have now more or less formed an acetal. There's only one thing remaining to happen, and that is for us to lose the proton. So if we lose the proton, the lone pair will go back onto the oxygen and as I said H+, plus, which isn't something that actually floats around on its own, but it's convenient to draw and think of it like that, is sent back into the reaction. So the acid, the H+, plus, acts as a catalyst for this reaction. It doesn't get consumed in the reaction. You're left with their H+. Plus. So let's think about what happened here. We started off with a ketone, it works with an aldehyde, and an alcohol, or two alcohols, but in this case our two alcohols are in the one molecule. The reaction goes forward and eventually it kicks out water. But all of these steps are reversible. So you can form acetals or you can turn acetals back into alcohols and uh, ketones or aldehydes. And all that tells you which way this reaction is going to go is what conditions it's in. So like Le Chatelier's principle says, if you take away the products, you're going to end up with more products, the equilibrium will push to that side. And if you add in more on this side, you'll end up with that side. And so we can govern this reaction by either putting in lots of water or taking out the water. And in this case, we'd be taking out the water using something like a Dean Stark apparatus. So you can see a picture of that here. And if you want to go the other way around, you just put in a big excess of water and some acid and you'd end up back here. Okay, if you have any questions or you'd like any other information about this reaction, let me know. Post below. Alright, that's all for now. Thanks. Bye.